I think it's such a blessing when people take something that was really hard in their life and turn around and make it into a coaching process where they can help others. And that's what our next guest did. Building spirituality, family, health, and business. This is The Giant Builders with Lois Wyant. Hey, Giant Builders. Guess what time it is? It's Tuesday at two, so here we are. And today I am with Tracy Franklin Sewell. And one of the things I want to point out is that she is a breast cancer survivor. And yeah, um, if you'll recall and just go back, uh, we did do a interview on January 11th that referred to breast cancer too. So please go back and look at that. And how are you, Tracy? Very well, Lois. Thank you for having me here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Glad to meet you. So why don't you tell us about your breast cancer situation that you went through? So in October 2011, I was watching a movie and it was about, and Harry Connick Jr. starred in this movie, and it was about breast cancer. Cool. It was about the doctor who invented Herceptin which is a drug used for HER2 positive breast cancer patients. Before this drug was invented, people with breast cancer that was HER2 positive died. Oh, It was a guaranteed life sentence. You were terminal when you got that diagnosis. So I was sitting there watching that movie and I was thinking to myself, oh, you know what? I haven't done a self breast exam lately. This movie's reminding me to do that. So I went and I did my self breast exam. And when I did that, I found a lump and a thickening of my right breast, Hmm. not far from my nipple and my areola. And at first I didn't believe what I was feeling. I was like, no, I'm not feeling something. No, this can't be, this can't be, this can't be a thing. And so I went back and I was like, okay, I'll, I'll just check it later. It's probably just the way I was lying on the couch, or it's probably just something in my head. I don't know what this is. So I'll check it later. So I went back and I checked it and I'm like, no, there's definitely something there. Mm -hmm. So I said to my husband, do you feel this or is it just me? And he's like, I don't feel anything. Hmm. And I was like, okay, this is kind of strange. So I thought, you know what? I'll call my doctor and get a mammogram. I'd had a baseline mammogram at 35 uh, because I'm adopted and I finally got my birth records at 35 and on it was breast cancer. So I, we did a baseline at 35 just to be safe, right? You never know. So I go see my doctor and I have a mammogram And two weeks later, the mammogram comes back that there is something there. But the path, you know, the radiologist is like, you know what, it's probably just fancy term adenofibroma, which is it means a benign tumor. So probably nothing to worry about. So I was like, okay, nothing to worry about, right? And my doctor was like, we need, let's do an ultrasound just to be sure. I'm like, okay. So I go for an ultrasound. And when I go, they decide to do a biopsy at the same time as the ultrasound. So get the local put in, they take six pieces of, and you know, it's funny what, one of the things I remember looking back at that journey was when they were doing the biopsy, I probably should have clued in that they were look that they were specifically doing something because he kept saying, you know, Doppler on, he was looking for, blood vessels, because cancer tumors, a lot of blood vessels feed into the cancer tumor. Okay. And that's how it grows. So, you know, quickly, right? So there's a lot of blood vessels attached to it. So he kept saying Doppler on, which means he was looking for blood flow. And I should have clued in then that something was not quite right, but I didn't. And I don't know whether that was just my brain protecting myself not sure. I think that's probably what happened. So then two weeks after that, 
on November 25th, 2011, I went into the doctor's office, into the general surgeon's office, and was told the news by a colleague of mine who I'd worked with for 10 years. Which is, I don't many, know if we mentioned, but you're a nurse also. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I work in the operating room. And um, so I had worked with this physician for many years in general surgery. And I remember him walking in the room and he was, you could see the shocked look on his face that it was me. And he didn't really, I get looking at the chart, it, my name didn't quite clue in because it was out of context, right? So when he saw me, he, you could see the shock look like, oh no. Not you. And I kind of looked at him and I was like, and my wheels started turning a little bit. And then he sat down and he looked at the notes and he looked back at me and he said, you have cancer. I was 39 years old. And I would love to say I was brave and I put on a, you know, a brave front and I, and I took it on the chin and I was really still, I sat there and stared at him. All of a sudden my brain went fuzzy. I couldn't hear properly and the tears just started coming involuntarily. Like I don't even, it wasn't even a conscious thing. I just, they just started coming. And I was like, I was in shock. I couldn't believe that this was happening at 39 years old that I had to go through cancer. So he gave me a bunch of options, which I knew were coming. But in the moment when you're in that, that time frame, I'm not a nurse, I'm a patient. And I couldn't make a proper decision. I couldn't even think straight, for God's sakes. So I... I was just like, yeah, yeah, whatever kind of thing. Immediately after the appointment was when I started going for staging procedures. Immediately after I had to have a chest x-ray done and I just kept crying. I kept going to the bathroom to try and wipe my face up, make it decent for the x-ray techs. But I just, the waterworks just kept coming. And then the next thought was, as I'm driving home with my husband, was, what am I going to tell my kids? What am I going to tell my family? Because when you get your initial diagnosis of breast cancer, you don't have your stage yet. Hmm. So sometimes, so they don't, they can't tell you whether you're stage one or stage four. So up until I had my surgery, I didn't know what stage I was. And I could have been a four, I could have been a one, like I had no idea. And that is very scary. And when I had finally had my surgery two weeks later, it turns out I was a stage one. And I was what they call HER2 positive. Mm. And which is, which is interesting why I told that story at the beginning. Yeah. Because that would have been a death sentence for me in the 80s. There would have been no living with a HER2 positive diagnosis. So I knew I'm HER2 positive. I had invasive ductal carcinoma. And I didn't have any lymph node involvement, but I had invasive micro involvement into my lymph nodes. So we have lymph nodes all over our body and those remove toxins, but they also move fluid around our body. And that's how the cancer spreads is through your lymph nodes. Okay. So my lymph nodes in my armpit in the right side here, it did only had micro invasion. So when I got home that weekend after my diagnosis, I was like thinking back to what the doctor and I had spoken about in that appointment and said, no, I don't want a lumpectomy with sentinel lymph node biopsy. There's breast cancer in my history. I want to do a bilateral mastectomy. So when I went back to see my doctor the following week to confirm what procedure we were going to do, I said to him, no, I don't want to keep my breast. And at the time, he was like, that's very radical. You don't need to get rid of your breast. And I said, no, I, I cannot sleep at night having breast tissue in my body with a family history of breast cancer. And again, at this time, because I was adopted and I didn't have my full history, 
I didn't have the, the genetic testing tell, done till later. Mm-hmm. So all these decisions that I was making was based on a feeling and an intuition that I had that I needed to do something different for myself so I could sleep at night so that I could not live in fear every single day going forward in my life. And that's why I decided to do bilateral mastectomy. And then I had the opportunity of having the reconstruction done at the same time. So that's exactly what I did. Bilateral mastectomies with breast reconstruction with implants. And what they do is the implant is basically the shape of a breast but it's flat on the one side. So it can sit on your chest wall and they cut your pec muscles in half so that they slip the tip of the implant underneath the top part of the pec muscle. And then the bottom part lays on your pec muscle. And they take this sheet, what we call alloderm, which is like an inert dermis. And we make a hammock so that the breast implant doesn't, doesn't move around in there. (laughs) That would be awkward. That would be awkward. One boob down here, one boob up here, <laughs> floating all over the place. That would be awkward. So that's how they secure them in the mastectomy pocket. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so I went to sleep with breasts and I woke up with breasts. Now for some women, that's not an important thing. For me, it was, I was a 39 year old woman. And for me, it was important to go with breasts and wake up with breasts. And I was, had that opportunity to do that. So The thing about body image is it's very different for every woman of how they want their body to look. Mm -hmm. And that's what I say to women is when you're making these kinds of decisions, you have to use your intuition and what feels right for you. And then you have to self-advocate for yourself because a lot of people will say, well, you know, the doctor said lumpectomy. If that's comfortable for you, go for the lumpectomy. You don't have to take your breasts off if you don't want to. It's each individual woman has to make their choice as to how they want to proceed forward in what they want will, as I said before, sleep at night. Mm -hmm. What will make you comfortable to sleep at night? Now, because I was young, because of the history, they decided they were going to throw as much as uh, chemotherapy at me as they could. So I had six rounds of chemo and then a year of the drug Herceptin was what I ended up having. My first round of chemotherapy was in February of 2012, February 6th. And people are like, you actually remember the date? (laughs) Day you don't forget. (laughs) It's a day you don't forget. Well, one thing I wanted to mention um, too about the pathology was when the pathology came back and I met with my oncologist for the first time, she said to me, she asked me, she goes, how did you know to remove your breasts? And this is where the intuition comes in. And I said, it just felt right for me. And she said, the reality is you had, as well as having cancer in the right breast, you had what they call hyperplasia cells already in the left breast. Mm. So what does that mean? Hyperplasia cells are cell changes. Your cell doesn't look like it should. It wasn't cancerous, but they were changing. So to me, that meant my body, I listened, my body was speaking to me. It told me, do this. And she said, you saved your life. And that's huge. Mm -hmm. Listening to your body, your body will speak to you. So my first round of chemotherapy was a very terrible experience. And again, chemotherapy is different for every single person. I had a horrible experience. I was very sick. I ended up having to be on IV fluids and all of these things that are not fun, Mm -hmm. but you do it. I remember sitting in the chair, my first round of chemo thinking, somebody's going to come and they're going to say to me, this was all a mistake. You can go home. (laughs) That would have been nice. (laughs) It would have been great. But nobody came and did that. They were like, oh, nope, here you are. You're in the right place. And I remember thinking, The nurse, she got dressed up in her outfit. She got her PPE on, her protective equipment on, gloves, gown, goggles, mat, the whole kit and caboodle. 
to get ready to hang, just to hang the chemo. And I was looking at her thinking to myself, you get to get dressed up. You have to get dressed up for this with all this protective equipment. And that's going into my veins, into my body. I don't get any protection from this. I just get this all into my body. But the one thing I focused on during the chemotherapy, the six rounds, was the fact that this was going, part of the journey was going to save my life. And I had to focus on that. And I had to believe that. Because hope is so important when you're going through a journey like this. Because it shakes the very foundation of your mortality of life and puts death right here in front of your face and reminds us that life is fragile and life can be short. And so that, you know, it hit me like, Mm-hmm. Like a ton of bricks, like a ton of bricks. And during the whole time that I was going through the treatment, and by the way, I didn't have to have radiation because the tumor was far enough away from my chest wall that I didn't need radiation. But while I was going through this the whole time, I was what was in what I call nurse mode. Other people call it survival mode. Okay. <laughs> where you're, just, you're just dealing with one step in front of the other what the next chemo treatment, I was counting them down. Okay. That was six. Next is five. Next is four, three, two, and so forth. And it wasn't till after all of the experience, the surgeries, the chemo, the diagnosis, everything came to a head. That was much later. During the time I was good. I was, I was like, yeah, we're going to get this done. It's going to be fine. It's going to be great. And then when it was over, I remember thinking at the end, everybody was like, you're fine now. You're great now. You're fantastic now. And I remember thinking, I'm not fine at all. I don't recognize the person in the mirror anymore. My hair was coming back curly. I had dead straight hair. My hair was coming in with no color. I lost all the pigment in my hair. It was coming in like white gray. I was going, I went from being 125 pound long distance runner to 175 pounds who could barely walk two feet Mm. without getting out of breath. I didn't recognize who I was. And so Everybody was like, you're fine, you're great, you're what? And I'm like, I'm not fine. And that's when the real work began on rebuilding who I was, grieving the loss of who I was before and the life that I had before to this new version of myself that I didn't recognize and had to learn to accept and to love. And it took me a while even just to look at my breasts in the mirror. Because when I looked at them, they reminded me of what happened. And that took a long time for me to look at them and go, "Eh, not so bad. I don't need to wear a bra today. I can wear a shirt without a bra. Fantastic. And so that took a long time. And also took a long time to figure out where did I fit in this new world where this happened, this momentous thing happened to me? What is my life purpose now? What is it that I'm supposed to be doing that maybe I wasn't doing before? And how am I going to approach life now in this new space as opposed to where I was before? Because your priorities change when you go through something like this, your thought process changes. The wanting to take life by the horns and going increases because you understand that life is so fragile and nothing is guaranteed. I think when by the time I finally felt like I could take a full breath of peace was when I hit the five-year mark and knew that I had a great chance of survival. But up until that point, you still have that fear in the back of your mind. Whenever there's a pain or a twinge or a 
something doesn't feel quite right and you're like, oh my goodness, did it come back? Or every doctor's appointment you go to and they want to, you know, check things out and look things over and you get scanned anxiety because you're like, is this going to be the day they tell me it comes back? And so that's a lot of work we have to do to rebuild our lives. And in it, it's hard because you're, you almost feel alone in, it, in that phase of it because everybody else around you has moved on. And you don't want to burden them with your troubles. At least I didn't. Because I was thinking to myself, you've already gone through the same journey I went through as a caregiver, you know, my husband, my children, my parents, my brothers, you had to watch this and that was hard on you too. So I don't want to burden you with what's going on up here. So I'm not going to tell you about it. I'm going to just deal with it on my own. And I wish I had had something that could help me process that a little bit quicker instead of, you know, muddling through all by myself on this island, all by myself, not knowing where it was I was supposed to go. So that took me a little bit of time to figure all of that out and become the person I am today. Lots of life lessons learned. Lots of things that I've changed. I'm more outgoing now than I was before cancer. I'm more easily able to put myself out there come on talk with you on your podcast. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have done that before. I wouldn't have gotten on an international stage with Team Canada for Kangoo Jump before cancer. I would have been too afraid of, well, what would people think of me? Would they think I was crazy? Did they, you know what I mean? All of that stuff going through your head. I'm like, forget it. I'm getting up there. I don't care what people think. This is me. This is it. This is who you get and have fun doing it. And I'm not saying it's all roses. So don't get me wrong. There are days where the fatigue that I still have reminds me of my journey. There are days where I struggle with my menopausal symptoms that I was put in because of cancer. Mm -hmm. There are days where I look at my daughter who's 20 now, who I fear will have to have the same path as I did and that fear sits close to my heart because my birth mother had it her mother had it her brother's kids all the girls had it Mm -hmm. and that fear sits here because I think I don't want her to go through this I don't want her to have to sit in that chemo chair I don't want her to have to make a decision of having bilateral mastectomies but I know she will if she has to go through this because it's a strong gene And so all of those things remind me every once in a while. And then I take a deep breath and I say, okay, we can't worry about what ifs. We can only deal with the here and the now, the moment right here, right now, today. She's healthy. She's doing well. I've taught her how to do self-breast exams. I've talked to her about some of the decisions she may or may not have to make. I've done what I can. And I'm not God, so I can't change her path if that's what it is. But I, I will be there with her if she has to go through it. And knowing there's a source that she can turn to for that support and guidance is, like I said, I'm praying that never happens to her. But if it did, I would be that person for her so that she doesn't have to flounder through this life of unknown and uncertainty and, and fear and anxiety and all of those things that go along when your life is shaken to the core, when you were told that C word that nobody in this world ever wants to hear. Mm-hmm. And so I re- that's how I ground myself back to this moment today. Is this true right now? No, it's not true right now. We can't put the what if away. You can't deal with that. What is true right now? And, you know, I have fun now a lot more than I used to. And I also speak up for myself a lot more than I used to. 
because I'm thinking, how can I, if I'm not speaking up for myself and what my wants and needs are, how's anybody around me going to know? <laughs> they can't guess. So guess what? You're going to be more vocal. You're going to tell people, I don't like this. This feels uncomfortable. I can't do this in the way that you require me to do this. You know, I had an opportunity not that long ago to, to a friend of mine asked me, she said, do you want to climb Count Kilimanjaro? And at first I was like, hmm, that would be fun. But the one thing I realized was because of my fatigue that I deal with, climbing that kind of mountain with altitude is probably not the best thing for me mm -hmm. physically. So I did have to turn that down. Um, but recognizing what it is that I have, I have certain limitations that will probably be with me for the rest of my life. And I've learned to live within those limitations. When I'm really tired from the fatigue, even today, I listen to my body and I go, you know what? You need a nap. Go nap. That's it. Give your body that rest. So when you, when you have symptoms that continue to, to persist, like pain, um, some women have fatigue, the menopausal symptoms, there are things we can do to make those symptoms better so that you can have a better quality of life. For example, in menopause, sleeping is not that easy. <laughs> sleeping can be hard at three in the morning when all of a sudden you feel like you're on fire. <laughs> And you're like, I am sweating buckets here. I am dripping. What is going on? You've got a fan blowing here, a fan blowing here. So taking something as simple as liquid magnesium will help you sleep and calm the mind. You know, and that's one thing that I, I tell some of my clients, you know, trying different things that help to make your life better, to manage the symptoms. Even 10 years later, sometimes we have to do that. Like I said, with fatigue, making sure that I nap, rest when my body says so. If I'm trouble sleeping, taking the magnesium, getting to bed on time, making it a habit, getting that quality of sleep because so sleep is so important for just general health. I don't even have to be a cancer thriver to want to look after your general health. It's so helpful to sleep and get good quality sleep. So just doing things like that helping you figure out what foods give me energy, what foods take my energy away, as simple as that. Getting back in tune with your body to help manage all the symptoms. Some people don't have any, but some of us like myself have a couple. So just managing them and living life, living your best life for however long or short it is. And that's what I've learned. That's a huge lesson. <laughs> it's huge. Yeah. Please tell us about the journey you're on now. So now that I'm 10 years out and I've had all this insight, um, I've decided that I don't want other breast cancer thrivers to feel like they're on an island by themselves anymore. So I've created a program. It's called a breast cancer recovery program. And I only do the program after treatment because I don't, you have enough to deal with going through treatment and going through all of that stuff. This is something for after when you, when you stop being a patient and become that person again. And that's when I come in. So we talk about in the program, how I can best support you work through the fear, work through the body image issues, help you minute manage symptoms that you're having. Talk about mindset, talk about life purpose. And that way you have a partner that's walking with you as you trying to figure out where you fit in this new place, this new you, new normal, whatever you want to call it, and reconnect with who you are meant to be now. And also grieve the loss of who you were before. And so I'm that support that breast cancer support coach to help people get to where they are meant to be now and to start living their best lives again for however long or short that is. Well, that's very honorable. I'm sure that that's just an amazing reach out for women and something to 
they can really grasp onto. What does like the first meeting look like with you? The first meeting <laughs> that we talk about is your symptoms. What are you experiencing right now? How can we help manage those? Because usually those are pressing at the beginning. And then as we go through the program, we, we go into mindset. What does that even mean? Then we start talking about how do you want to move your body in a way that's fun and not hard. So I gradually take people through the program slowly. I don't put a lot of action steps on people because one, I want everybody to experience it at their pace because it isn't about me. It isn't about what I need. It's about what they need and what you need. So I let the, the client guide me in terms of where they're at. We talk about self-sabotage as well in how we kind of do that to ourselves a little bit sometimes because we want to go back to what was comfortable. We keep wanting to go back there, but that may not serve you anymore, that old place. So stretching and growing through the self-sabotage, sometimes we have to break through it. And then we start getting into the harder stuff about fear and life purpose. And that way, and also we do talk about nutrition as well, um, because a lot of times we, we're not sure what to eat anymore. So I'm not about, like my program has nothing to do with weight loss that way. What it does have to do is saying, you know what? How about you try this item as a more nourishing, something more nourishing for your body instead of this? You know, try sweet potato over white potatoes. Or how about trying, instead of having meat all the time, hey, why don't we introduce tofu as a little substitute? You know what I mean? Different things like that so that you can have a variety and if you're more eating things that don't nourish your body as well, let's figure out what does and let's figure out what works for you. So that's where the food aspect comes in as well. So there's so many different aspects to the program. And sometimes people are like, you know what, can we touch on this? You know, whatever comes up for them. Mm -hmm. And then I will, and then we'll explore it. And then we'll come up with goals and action steps around what it is that the client needs at that time. So I do have like an overall program, but I also like the client to guide me in where they are and where they want to go. And so that's how, that's basically how my program works. It's 12 weeks. So it's not a long time. And um, it's a great way to have that support when you're going from patient to person again. As a, maybe a friend of somebody who's going through cancer or after cancer, what is the best way for us to support women who are going through this process? Say hi. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Anybody can do that. Yeah. I know it's, it's tricky. I had friends that did this with me when I was going through breast cancer, people that I had been friends with since high school and they did not know what to do. Therefore they did nothing. Mm. I didn't hear from them. I didn't get a text. I didn't get a phone call. I didn't even get visits. Sometimes all we need is just to say, somebody to say, hi, how are you today? We don't need a big grand gesture, you know, coming and cooking 10 different meals or, you know, showing up on my doorstep with cupcakes every week. We don't need that. What we need is to know that people are thinking about us and that we matter and that they, that, that we matter to you and that you're there. We don't you're like our goal is not to burden everyone with all our problems. I can guarantee you most of us don't even want to talk about the problems we have. You know, some of us during chemotherapy, there are problems with sexuality. There's problems with all kinds of different things. So we don't want to burden people with all of that. But it really is nice to know that you're there. Okay. So saying hi is huge. 
Well, that's a great tip. I'm really glad to know being small is being big. Because I would have loved to have just had that phone call. Hi. Mm -hmm. How are you? Did you have a shitty day? Pardon my French. That's no, okay. <laughs> but that's all. That's all. Uh -huh. That's all we need. And if we, most breast cancer thrivers as they're going through treatment are very good at figuring out when to tell people what they do need. Mm. So if there was something specific that I did need, like I can't cook today, can somebody help me? Because I can barely stand. I had a friend come over and make soups for me. Or, you know, I got a cleaning lady to help me with the cleaning because I wasn't able to do it anymore. Or if I, if I was too sick from chemo to pick up my kids from school, I had somebody that would help me with that. Or if I needed a break, I would call my neighbor and say, can you come get the kids? Because they were 10 years old. Can you come get the kids? I can't right now. Mm -hmm. And they would come. So we get very good at expressing what it is we need. And that's a good thing because then we're able to tell everybody exactly what we require at that moment. But yeah, just saying hi and just, you know, letting us know you're still there and that you care. That's all that matters. Were you angry during this? No. Okay. I was never angry. I never questioned why because whenever I would even slightly go there, it would be, well, like, why not? It could have been me. It could have been somebody else. It could have been my friend. It could have been my mom. It could have been, could have been anybody. Um, so that to me didn't serve me. What I needed was to cling on to hope. What I needed was to get through it and then figure out where I fit in afterwards. So mm -hmm. to me, anger didn't serve me. And in the end, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about what I needed for myself and how to figure out what it is that I need to do to make this life the best life for me. That's great. So yeah, I was, I was, never, ang I was never angry. Okay. Well, how can people get in touch with you? Where can they find you? They can find me. I am all over social media. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, I am on Facebook under Tracy Franklin, F-R-A-N-K-L-A-N-D. I'm also under Transform Me Coaching, T-R-A-N-S-F-O-R-M-E Coaching for Facebook and Instagram. You can follow me there. I'm also on LinkedIn under Tracy Franklin Sewell. And I'm also on TikTok. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on TikTok. So in my content, I educate people about breast cancer. Um, I talk about my journey on all of my platforms. And yeah, if you have any questions, you want to get in touch with me, I also have a website, transfermecoaching.ca, T-R-A-N-S-F-O-R-M-E dot coaching dot C-A. And you can look at all my programs there. I have a, a couple of programs as well as the breast cancer recovery program. Um, and also information on my fitness classes of as well, if you're in the GTA area. And yeah, send me an email. I will be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Oh, thank you. Any closing thoughts? When you're going through something like this, take one step at a time. Sometimes it's one minute at a time. And sometimes it's one hour at a time. And sometimes it's one day at a time. Be kind to yourself. This is a big deal. And this is a time that you want to be a little bit selfish. There's always hope in everything that we do. And cling on to that hope. And that'll get you through the worst of it. Mm, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I think I go hug, hug my husband now. <laughs> 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 Well, Tracy, thank you so much for sharing with us and for your bravery through your journey and being able to share all of that detail with us. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. And uh, if I can help one person, my job here is done.
No, great. All right, Giant Builders, mark your calendars next Tuesday at 2. See you then. Thank you for listening. This has been The Giant Builders with Lois Wyant. <laughs>